Uh, my name is Brad Young with the Department of State Treasurer. Uh, I want to welcome you to our April Ask Me Anything session with Treasurer Falwell. Uh, this is uh, a, an opportunity that we like to extend to the press around the state uh, and not just to the Raleigh uh, markets to have access to Treasurer Falwell and ask him anything uh, that might be of interest to their area or to the state's business and the retirement systems, the state health plan, and uh, in reaching all 100 counties. So uh, we're going to ask that you put all the phones on mute if it's not your turn to ask a question. And without any further ado, I will hand it over to Treasurer Falwell. Thank you, and uh, thank you all for joining us uh, this morning, and uh, happy uh, post-Easter. Just a couple of brief uh, comments before we get started uh, to tell you some things that have happened since our last call. Uh, we've done a, a, a statewide uh, rollout of our ABLE product. Uh, that's one of the responsibilities of the State Treasurer's Office. ABLE stands for Achieving a Better Life Experience. It's equivalent to a 529 for people who are going to college or an IRA for people who are planning for retirement. It's a way for people who have disabilities uh, in North Carolina uh, to receive funds and those funds be put into a tax deferred account, but that it does not offset against their uh, social security earnings or assets. Uh, so it's a way for people to assist people who have special needs, uh, not only now, but probably for the rest of their life. Uh, secondly, uh, we continue to work on the annual benefit statement. It's been an issue for me actually for the last 12 years. Uh, I think it's difficult to be in a relationship uh, with some of our stakeholders where uh, you sometimes uh, you don't get credit for what you do for people, uh, but uh, you get discredited for what you didn't do for people. So the annual benefit statement is something that we're uh, currently trying to develop for next year. Uh, we think it's important to show every member of the state health plan and the pension plan, not just what this will be worth to them at some point in the future, but what the present value of this obligation is <clears throat> in terms of the appropriation that's being put a set aside into the defined benefit plan for their purposes. Uh, we continue on our cost efficiency and structural simplification options for our investment management division. Uh, this is where we had uh, promised the people of North Carolina to cut fees uh, by the end of my first term by $100 million. Uh, that $100 million was over a four-year period. We are uh, almost uh, at $25 million already in the first 100 days of our our uh, our time here at the treasurer's office. Uh, obviously, we're not going to stop at $25 million. Uh, we're going to keep reducing complexity and building value for the people of the pension plan as well as the people of North Carolina. Uh, the last thing uh, that I'll share with you uh, is that uh, we continue to work on our new accounting standards. Uh, these are accounting standards that uh, GASB, Government, Governmental Accounting Standards Series, is uh, making us and actually every uh, municipality and governmental entity to adopt these new standards regarding their post health care retirement and pension obligations. Since we last spoke, I believe we uh, have a new OPEB, OPEB report uh, that shows that uh, according to our actuaries, our, the present value of our future obligation for health care for North Carolinians, for North Carolina active and retired state employees, is now $42 billion. So <clears throat> we are uh, working on all those things as well as the other business of the treasurer's office. We appreciate you joining us. Uh, we hope that you find these things helpful and I'll be glad to, for you to ask me anything at this point. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. Uh, so first name on our list we have is Dan Way from the Carolina Journal. Dan, are you with us? Yes. <clears throat> Morning, Dan. Hey, Treasurer uh, I was wondering, you know, there are a couple of competing tax plans out there. Input they've been seeing from you and, and what 
concerns or, or I'm concerned you have about any of this? Well, thank you for your question, Dan. Uh, North Carolina is very unique in, in a lot of ways. Uh, at the treasurer's office, for example, I'm the sole fiduciary of the pension plan, which is there's only a, less than a handful of people in the uh, in the country that have that responsibility. But to go to your specifically to your question, uh, we are unique in a lot of other ways. Uh, we get calls every day uh, for people asking us about their taxes. Uh, so uh, your question really goes to not only the treasurer's office, but also the Department of Revenue, the controller's office, as well as the uh, Office of State Ma Management Budget, as well as the, uh, the General Assembly and, and the laws that are coming through there. <clears throat> the only thing that I've uh, opined about is the constitutional amendment to put a cap on the, uh, the income tax rates of North Carolinians. Uh, I have not, and to this day have not, uh, heard any uh, or gotten any input or calls uh, from any of the rating agencies regarding the income tax, the constitutional amendment to cap the income tax in North Carolina. Now the reason I, I say that and to answer your question is that uh, I have not looked at these competing tax plans. I just know that as the keeper of the public purse, one of my responsibilities is to maintain the AAA bond rating. And you know, that's also uh, tangentially the responsibility something the governor's interested in as well as uh, the Speaker of the House and the President Pro Tem and every member of the legislature. I think we're in a unique position in the Treasurer's Office that everybody wants us to succeed as, as far as the AAA bond rating. Uh, but second, which is tangential to your question, Dan, is that uh, obviously we're looking and we have introduced, there's been legislation introduced on our behalf regarding the Solvency Fund so we are curious in terms of our solvency fund uh, how all that sort of works into these uh, tax packages that have been proposed. So have you gotten any input back at all? Uh, I have not uh, received any input. Uh, you know, we're working as hard as we, you know, this is like yoga for us. We're trying to breathe and pay attention to our own mat, uh, M-A-T. And uh, so, uh, we're just totally focused on, you know, especially with crossover coming up, uh, trying to get the bills passed that, uh, that, that we have. Uh, we have obviously presented as the treasurer's office to a joint committee of appropriations chairs <clears throat> about all these issues. You know, I, you've heard me say this before and I'll repeat it. Uh, the poet T.S. Eliot once said, hell is where nothing connects. And this is not hell. Of all of these things, both of what you've mentioned and what I've talked about, all these things connect to something else, and that is to preserve and strengthen uh, North Carolina's financial stability, uh, which is what we intend to do. All right, thank you, Treasurer. Uh, Dan, did you have any other additional questions? No. Uh, okay. Uh, is Eric Spanberg from the Charlotte Business Journal online yet? Okay, uh, was there anyone else that had questions that's on the line that would, would like to pose them to Treasury follow up? Well, if nobody does, let me, let me ask. Okay. Let okay. me jump back in there, man. On that uh, 25 billion on the uh, fees, mm -hmm. how did you manage that? I mean, those immediate, or are they going to be phased in over time? Or? Uh, they've. Uh, we report things as we do them. So uh, all those savings are already in the oven. Uh, so those are those are immediate. Uh, I will uh, I will add that uh, as we are a couple of weeks away from reporting our first quarter numbers, that uh, the, the, the this whole fee thing is all over the map because uh, we have tens and tens of billions of dollars of the pension plan that is in fee arrangements where there's quote a performance fee for performing and uh, with interest rates going down real estate markets going up stock market going up after president trump was elected uh, you could see some of those performance fees start to hit uh, these are fees that people have earned uh, but uh, we, you know we have not yet paid because we haven't been billed for them but obviously the only way they can earn them is to, is to produce profits for us and and 
a lot of those involve distributing the money back to us, and that's uh, so those all, all those fees have actually uh, are, are are done, and now we're working on the next twenty five million. Dale, hey, it's Dane Hoffman at Triangle Business Journal. Hey, Dane. Um, say, hey, thanks for talking to us. And I'll try to ask a question that's smart enough to elicit response that uh, involves yoga and TSL. Yeah, that was impressive. Oh, my, my, okay. Um, but to follow up on, on what Dan was asking about, about the 25 million, so how did you, how, how did you say that? Like, what was it that happened that caused that reduction? Because you're talking about a pretty significant amount of money. Was this part of the calls that you had? You said you want to call all the people who are doing this. Have you completed all those calls? Is that process gone? Could you just sort of tell us more about what you've done to sort of drive that down? Well, thanks for joining me, Dane. And uh, Dan, if you have another question, feel free to chime back in at a later point. Uh, the uh, 25 million represents less than 5% of the fees that we pay. And uh, okay. to directly answer your question, uh, we have completed uh, all the calls with the money managers, over 170 of them, and we've asked them the basic questions. Who are you, where are you, how good are you, and how much are we paying you? Uh, a lot of this fee reduction is the result of uh, folks that manage money for the state pension plan who were active managers who had underperformed their bench benchmark and underperformed in the index that we could have been had that money in into an index fund during that same period of time. So got it, got it. <clears throat> those are those are those are uh, money management uh, relationships that have, at least for that part of the portfolio have been terminated. Now I want to be very clear about this. Uh, so this you said have been terminated, so you terminated some of the relationships with the money managers. That's correct. But some of these money managers still have relationships with us uh, because this is the 26th largest pool of public money in the world so they may still have a defined contribution product with us uh, they may still have something inside the defined benefit plan where they're actually outperforming uh, their benchmarks so these are analysis that were given to us uh, by our consultants and by our investment management division uh, regarding how these folks have performed relative to their benchmark and the fees paid You've talked to 170 of your money managers. You've talked to pretty much everybody who sort of manages the pool of money for you. Correct. You've driven down that by 25 million that mm -hmm. the North Carolina, the state of North Carolina would have spent since you took office. The 25 million has been saved. Yes. So you want to save 100 million over the four years of your term. So how do you save the next 75 million? What happens to do that? Right. Well, the 25 million, if we save 25 million a year, that would be 100 million, but we're not, we're not, we're not finished. You know, when we've only, we've only done this with, we've only saved 5% of the 612 million in fees, that's, that's not acceptable to me. So we're not, you know, the purpose of talking about the 100 million is to always under promise and over deliver. Uh, so theoretically, you could say that we have over the four year period now, because we're going to save that for every year that we saved 100 million, but we're not stopping there. We're, we're, we're not stopping there at all. Uh, well, what well, the annual savings, 25 million this year, but you'd see it again in the next three years. <clears throat> that's correct, but, but we're not right. stopping there. Now, we are, uh, we're taking advantage of our buying power. Uh, we are, uh, people have been reading these articles, and uh, we've gotten a couple of few calls of people who are voluntarily uh, offered to reduce our fees. We're looking at every contract of some of these legacy products that are over 12 years old, 10 years old, uh, to make sure that they're even supposed to be charging us fees after they've been in a 10-year relationship with us. We are going to be delving deeper into these contracts uh, to make sure that people were not if not allowed by the contract, I didn't sign these contracts, I inherited them, but we want to make sure that if people were not supposed to be charging us fees on uninvested capital, then that they weren't. So uh, we have a lot of work to do in as far as scrubbing the fees to make sure that the fees that we're paying, even with the relationships that are ongoing, are proper. That's, that's going to be a lot bigger task than just calling the 175 managers. In some of these instances, Dane, 
Uh, we gave the money to people in 2015, late 2014. The money's not fully invested. As a matter of fact, there's almost $9 billion of uncalled capital out of the state pension plan right now. This is what I refer to as, as money that we're obligated to give these money managers that they have not yet drawn uh, against us. That's $9 billion of uncalled capital. Is there any way you would uh, recoup any of that money? Were uh, you know, the payments made that should be recouped? What do you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, we're. I mean, we're the keeper of the public purse, and we need to be treating this just like you would the money that's in your wallet. That's what we're doing. <clears throat> so what you're saying is effectively, I, I go out, Dana goes out, and pays somebody ten thousand dollars and say, "Hey, here's ten thousand dollars. I want to, I want you to invest it." But they only invest eight thousand, and they leave two thousand just sitting around. And then I go, wait, the stock market's going up. Why do you invest two thousand? In simple terms, that's what you're saying, right? What's well, actually, it's a little even. It's, it's, let me give you a little more detail. They could have taken down eight thousand of the ten, and not invested all of that yet, and still have two thousand sitting here that they can draw from us at a later point. It's even they could have a cash balance in what they've already drawn out of the treasurer's office and then have a cash balance of money that's still in the treasurer's office that we're obligated to give them that they haven't drawn. So it's actually two pieces. I follow you. Okay. All right. Good good analogy. Good, good, good analogy. So how how is that really the curve? What oversight was missing and what have you done to well, we just uh, we just paid uh, tens of thousands of dollars for an official report. The title of it says "Compliance and Fee Review for the State Treasurer's Office." Now, I'm a simple guy. If something says "Compliance and Fee Review," I would expect it that that report go through every one of these contracts with every one of these money managers and and answer these questions that we're talking about on this telephone call. <clears throat> but the fact is, is that this, the scope of that project was not what I expected once the report came out. I didn't, I didn't commission the report. It was something that was done with the previous administration. I just received the report back in February. So I think that we totally missed the scope of that project. What I, what I would like to have a report to say that had that title on the front cover is to go into every contract to make sure that the fees that we were paying were were per the contract and that's not what occurred and that's what we're starting to do right now hey this is dave building i uh, jumped on late do you see any role for alternative investments in the portfolio i think that uh the quite thank you does everybody today the name start with D? <laughs> it seems like. <laughs> okay. We'll get to the E's in a minute, guy. Whoever's on there with the last first name that starts with an E, we'll get to you in just a minute. <laughs> uh, but uh, glad to have you with you, Dave. Um, I mean, the there's lots of definitions of what an alternative investment is. Uh, I consider an alternative investment to be something where we we give money to people to manage on our behalf and we no longer own it, it owns us, which means there's a general partner, we're a limited partner, the general partner has 100% latitude about what to do with this, uh, with these funds. Uh, some people think of alternative investments as being timber. We own a billion dollars worth of timber. Uh, some people think uh, alternative investments would be owning barges that have uh, data centers on them that are floating around the ocean somewhere. Uh, I don't say that we don't own any of these. I don't think we do, but we, we could. Uh, uh, but so what I'm trying to do, Dave, is, is, to, is, is, is trying to figure out where our alternative investment portfolio is. And we have billions of dollars in something called funds of funds, fund of funds, where we have given money to Dave and then Dave took that money and gave part of it to Dan and part of it to Dane and part of it to Dale. And 
So we have a relationship with Dave Mendelberg. We don't have a relationship with the other three Ds. And, but all of us are managing money and we all report to Dave Mendelberg. Uh, that's what we call a fund of funds. A lot of people consider those to be alternative investments. So uh, we currently, to specifically answer your question, we do not have a forward calendar. If when the forward calendar kicks up, it's gonna be uh, focused on reducing complexity and building value. And most of our ability to reduce complexity and build value is going to be in index fund types of products where we're greatly underweighted uh, in relation to funds of our size. Is there any additional questions or follow-ups? I, I was hoping I could just want to think a deal. I mean, are, have you started putting the wood to the hospital industry in North Carolina in a similar fashion with the health plan? Putting the wood to? Uh, I have, uh, well, I'll be glad to talk about the state health plan because uh, I have a whole stack of papers here to talk about that about. Uh, let me close out on the pension plan just a moment, Dave, and then I'm going to answer your question. Uh, you can't see it, obviously, but it, it, somebody went back to 1958, uh, ironically, uh, when I was born, how sweet that is, uh, and showed the what's happening to interest rates versus the assumed rate of return of North Carolina. And obviously, when uh, Treasurer Bowles was able to invest money at 12% Treasury bonds, the ability to earn seven and a quarter percent was pretty, you know, pretty easy at that point. Uh, obviously, interest rates are closer to two percent, not 12% now. So I have that chart. If anybody would ever wants to have access to that, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention before we go over to the state health plan is to talk about an article that was in Pensions and Investments actually on the same page, uh, split down the middle. Uh, one is longevity risk and the longevity risk and system challenges to retirement plans. And it has to do, do with what's happening with our life expectancies, especially among females. Uh, sorry guys, uh, the male life expectancy in North Carolina has actually dropped every year for the last two years. Uh, the female life expectancy has been going up. but what 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 the, the the financial pressure that that puts on defined benefit plans when life it's a blessed event for life expectancies to go up but it's also a mathematical event the other side of this article is a grim view of public pension plan return assumptions and the reason i bring this up to you is it is it what's happened over the last uh, 15 years is that is that interest rates have gone down uh we've had two crises one is the tech bubble after 9 11 then the the uh, banking crisis of 2008, life expectancies are going up, fees are going up, interest rates are going down, you know, and all of you have heard me say this is not emotional or political, it's mathematical, and these two articles really come to the point of return assumptions about defined benefit plans and also increased life expectancies. In addition to that, uh, last month we paid out over $500 million out of these pension plans. For 30 days. So that's a run rate of six billion dollars out of the state pension plans on a yearly basis and I have another chart that's showing that's going to go to nine billion dollars over the next nine years. So over our investment returns last year we saw about a two billion two and a half billion dollar shortfall just in the pension plan over the contributions that came into the pension plan uh, plus the investment earnings. So I just wanted to cover that before I got on to uh, Dave Middleburg's question about the state health plan. Uh, we are now turning our attention uh, to the state health plan. We've made some pretty big moves over the last 100 days. Uh, and the reason is, is that I have another chart here which I can share with you that shows that the reserve balance of the state health plan, this is money that we have in reserves, uh, that in 2015, uh, this now I want to clarify this point with you. Uh, it's a little bit fluid right now. There's a very strong possibility that the appropriation to the state health plan this year is going to exceed the appropriation to the university system. Now, if you think about that closely, you'll realize that part of the money 
that we send to the university system comes back to the state health plan because they're also an employer of people. So, but just keep that in context of how massive and large this is really becoming. So in 2015, over the $3 billion of premium that we took in the state health plan, the state health plan lost uh, $125 million in 15 and over what we took in, another $160 million in 16. It's project in 17, we're going to lose another $300 million. Uh, that's going up to $500 million next year and $550 million the year after. This is in addition to the over $3 billion worth of premiums uh, that we're taking into the state health plan. Why should that matter to the people on this call? Well, number one, and I'm going to use the word agnostic for a moment, it's not a sermon, but as, a, as, a, as an employer of people, we're offering all these health plans. I should be financially agnostic about which one Dane chooses which, versus which one Dan chooses which, versus which one David chooses. I should be financially agnostic when I offer plans about which one you choose. That's not where we are right now. As a matter of fact, if people in the rearview mirror last year would have made the correct choice given their, their utilization of health care and prescription benefits, these plans would have lost an additional $292 million each of these years on top of what I've already told you. How's all, what does all that matter? What that means is that, is that, is that we're going to run out of reserves uh, sometime in the next 30 months. So my responsibility as the chair of the state health plan board is to make sure the mission statement is, is complied to. To put the state health plan, our mission, to put it in a financially sustainable manner. We are not in a financially sustainable manner when we keep losing hundreds of millions of dollars more than we take in as far as premiums. So what we're doing is we're zeroing in and we're cutting out things out of the state health plan that we think increased complexity and reduced value. One is our enrollment process. Virtually, generally speaking, no one that I hired in the month of January to work in the state treasurer's office, including myself, was able to successfully enroll in the state health plan without assistance. It's too complicated. We have all these different vendors and all these different systems that are required in order for us to, to enroll in the state health plan. And sometimes if they don't talk to each other in, in, the, in the end of the day. So what we have is we have teachers and troopers and other state employees, some of whom have never consumed any tobacco or smoked a cigarette in their life, who are paying smoking premiums because their smoking attestation did not g haul <clears throat> with the open enrollment process. So what are we doing about that next year? We're getting rid of the population health management survey. <clears throat> the population health management survey had 33 questions on it. Nine of the questions you could just bubble in, I don't know. People were just, in my opinion, 297,000 people filled out that survey. I predicted a majority of those people filled out that survey just to get the credit against their premium for the state health plan. We're doing away with that because I think it was a it's not a good process, it increased complexity, and it caused people uh, more confusion. Secondly, we're getting rid of the primary care physician designation. Uh, the reason is, is that inside the state health plan, you are financially incented to go to your primary care physician anyway. Why make people th go through another hoop in the open enrollment process just to get designate their PCP when there's a chance that when they designated John Doe is their, their primary care physician that didn't match up with the open enrollment process, kicked them out, then they lost their credit. So we're reducing all the complexity there. Uh, we're also getting rid of the CDHP plan. Uh, it, it, it's one of the richest plans when you look at the universe, and I have a graph on this, of all the states that are comparable in size to us and our border states, it's the second richest plan in that whole universe. That plan, only 6% of our people took advantage of it. Way too complex. To give you a really granular example, a lot of your listeners, a lot of your readers are familiar with HSA products. They think that this CDHP had an HSA component. 
An SHA is something you build, you build equity in and you can transport it. Our plan had an HRA. An HRA can only be utilized as while you're an employee of the state. But it was also wired to something called an FSA, a flexible spending account. You're all familiar with those. It's like milk. It has a shelf life. It expires on December 31st. Our plans were wired so that you had to burn through your HRA plan in order to access your FSA plan. Completely backwards. So way too complex. Uh, it did not bring value. And uh, so that's an example. So going back to your question, David, uh, everybody's going to participate. We are the largest purchaser of health care in North Carolina. We are no longer going to be a part of the medical arms race that's going on, whether it's in the country or in this state. We are going to take advantage of our buying power. We're going to reduce complexity. We're going to build value to the benefit of the participants of these plans and the taxpayers of this state. And we're all about the pennies and the paper clips. Is there any additional questions on state health plan? I have one question, being up and on the on the pension plan. Do you know what the pension is exactly now? Like how much is in there? Yes, there's a ninety-one billion seven hundred and thirty-eight million dollars uh, in the state pension plan. Uh, that that does that is that is the total pension plans. That's the teasers teachers and state employees, that's the elders, that's 99% of all the local employees, that's the National Guard, that's the fire and rescue, that's the judicial system, judicial system and the legislative system. And there's probably one more okay. in there. So it's about 91 billion. 91, billion. 91, yeah. Now that does not okay. include the over $10 billion that we have in the supplemental retirement plans 401k, 403b, and 457. Now, officially, we now have the largest supplemental retirement plan in the world. We have more participants in this plan, not assets. California's bigger on asset-wise. But we have more participants in this plan than any other defined contribution plan in the world right now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. David, David Middleberg, did I answer your question about uh, uh, cutting costs in the state yeah. health plan? Well, I, I, I wonder if will it be any uh, legislative action before the uh, 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 states can go home? Uh, as far as the state health plan? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm also sole fiduciary of the state health plan, uh, in addition to the pension plan. So we have uh, lots of... Uh, uh, space in order to affect the policies that we need to, to affect. Number one. Right. Number one. Number two, uh, our big contract for our third party administration, we have lots of big contracts that are coming up over the next 19 months as far as the state health plan are concerned. Uh, we just rolled out, Treasurer Cowell just implemented the one for the pharmacy benefit, uh, which is about a third of our health care spend. So uh, we are focused on these contracts, and uh, one of the many things that I learned, uh, going back to Dane's question about, or Dan's question about calling these money managers, is that uh, in, in so many instances, I just came to realize that we've been signing other people's contracts, they haven't been signing ours. And we're gonna take that spirit of what I just said to you, and we're also gonna apply it to the state health plan. Uh, uh, th this is a, this is a, a big deal. Uh, there's no reason that the largest purchaser of something in this state shouldn't be able to do it better and more efficiently on behalf of participants. And when we have a criteria that we're going to use that every time we save a penny in a paper clip in the state health plan, we have a criteria that we're going to use about where we're going to apply that money uh, going forward. And um, that's how we're thinking about it. So, and, and, and the number one thing is that we're going to apply it. We, we have a plan now. We, we've, instituted premiums for the first time. <clears throat> and David, probably more than anyone else on the call, you're keenly aware of what's going on in South Carolina right now with their pension and health care plan. Uh, we do not want to become 
South Carolina, and we will not. But the point of me saying that is that we did implement uh, uh, premiums uh, for the first time on individuals in the state health plan in our last board meeting. And but at the, I know you're through, but at the end of the day, we've got a five-year plan for the state health plan. At the end of the day, uh, we're still looking at uh, about somewhere between 81 and 82 percent of the total spend for the state health plan being paid for by the uh, state or the underlying agency that the employee works for, and eight, 18 percent uh, by the employee, and that's uh, based on the models that we're using. The strategy that we're trying to implement uh, that will not vary by one percent over the next five years and the reason we need that we need to give certainty to our stakeholders we need to give certainty to the general assembly to the taxpayers of this state about where we're headed over the next five years with the state health plan thank you uh, do we have any other follow-up questions before we wrap up Uh, one comment about the uh, eligibility audit. Uh, no one asked me about that. Uh, David, you, you sparked my memory on that. We're in the midst of an eligibility audit. Uh, in 2012, uh, something I've been trying to get the state health plan to do since 2006. Uh, they did one in 2012. They found 7,103 people who were on the state health plan who were not entitled to be on the state health plan. And we estimate that that's saving $22 million, uh, getting those people off the state health plan. We're about, we're about to embark in a, another eligibility audit. I think this eligibility audit will be even more dramatic than the last one we just did because uh, that, if you think back in 2011, 2012, we were in the midst of, of raising the dependent age to 26. Uh, we hope that we don't find people on the state health plan who are no longer married, but they tell the state health plan they are, but I think we will. I hope that we don't find dependents on the state health plan who are, who are not the children of the uh, member who is the subscriber to the state health plan, but I think we will. Uh, all of those things are, uh, we got to make sure that only the people that are getting money out of the pension plan and the state health plan and that we're providing services for are the people that are entitled to it. There are going to be strong repercussions for individuals who are active employees who have knowingly and willingly have falsified uh, their enrollment process either this year or the previous two or three years uh, where they have uh, lied uh, to the state health plan about who they're married to or who their dependents are. Very strong repercussions for those individuals. Great. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Treasurer, and thank you for everyone that participated in the call today. We will have the entire call, uh, the audio of which uh, posted on YouTube and our website uh, later today or tomorrow morning at the latest. Uh, thank you so much for participating, and we hope that you'll take part next time we do one of these calls again. Thank you all uh, for coming on, and if you have any suggestions for uh, Frank or Brad about uh, how we can make these calls better, uh, we, we'd love to have those suggestions, and we hope this is of value to you.